There we go. Oh, wait, it's stuck on me. There we go. Okay, we're good. Hey, how's it going? It's, it's going. It's now fall here. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks to global warming, though, it's been really nice here. It's been, yeah. you know, a little uh, hurricane-y, but other than that, it's been nice. I think we're having pretty normal weather, but uh, we're hitting that time of year when the farmers are getting ready to harvest all their fields, and we're getting ready for uh, massive pollen and soybean re soybean beetle release. How is the shutdown affecting you? You want to make me cry on no. air? I, I, we will. We'll both. We'll both cry because it is. It has been. It's been. I mean, like, like I know it's like I don't know. First world problem. Like. For me, like, like we're trying to work on stories. We're trying to work on historical stuff, and and it is like, you know, oh, I need to find an image of Luna three, and and then, uh, you know, no access. Yeah, I wish it was only that bad for us. I know, it's... I know. So, like, I know. So it's not a big, deal. like, it's not a huge deal. We're able to run around it a bit and find cached images and look in look in the wayback machine and find yeah. this stuff. So for us. And there's not a lot of news coming out of that, but there's still a lot of news coming out of other outlets. So you know, it's not it's not killing us, but for you, this has just got to be just horrendous. Well, it's it's one of these things where I don't think people realize the long-term ramifications this is going to have. For instance, with the National Science Foundation set down, shut down, we can't log in to find out what the details are for writing grants that have up to upcoming grant deadlines. We can't. Uh, submit new grants. This is going to cause delays in all of the upcoming programs that do actually get funded if the government ever turns itself back on. And gaps in funding mean you lose your job. Um, and with sequestration already nine months in, I think it's been that long, maybe not quite that long, um, we're we're already starting to suffer. The the NASA grant that should have gone up for renewal over a year ago, that grant got delayed one year because they needed to, to restrict funding and then sequestration cut in and the president budgets cut in and they put that grant call on hold now more than a year and a half into waiting to renew a grant. And this is going to start causing people to permanently lose their jobs. Um, yeah, and so like 97% of NASA employees are staying home right now. Yeah, and, and it, it, it when we sent out the, the CosmoQuest newsletter last week, it was just like away message after away message of I've been furloughed and I'm not allowed to check email on this account from NASA employees who follow the CosmoQuest newsletter. And uh, I'm on the uh, Societal Organizing Committee for the Communicating Astronomy to the Public meeting next week, and we're getting messages from people who are saying if the government doesn't turn on in the next couple of days, they won't be able to go. And that's money that's just thrown out the window because the airplane ticket's are already purchased. So do you think, how long do you think it can go in this shutdown mode before it starts to cause irreparable damage to the current flow of projects. Missions, you know, launch windows are going to start getting missed. Um, well, you know? so so they, they managed to, to salvage the launch of MAVEN by declaring uh, the, the project an emergency and getting an emergency continuation. Um, I, I honestly think anything more than a month is going to cause a backlog of paperwork that takes so long to recover from that there will start to be jobs lost. Right. Just because we can't get the funding out, we we can't get things reviewed, it's... <sighs> there's yeah. a lot of stuff not getting done and, and the work doesn't stop coming in just because people aren't allowed to work on it. and. How do you recover from losing one month out of the year worth of work time? I know what it's like. I mean, when I go on vacation, if I, you know, if I'm gone for a week, mm -hmm. I come back. It's not like anybody did my work. It's all there right. waiting for me. Right, right, exactly. And 
one of the things that really got me annoyed yesterday was there was a vote to provide back pay to uh, federal employees that are currently on furloughed. So salaried employees of the federal government will receive pay for the time they're not working. Okay. But what about the hourly employees who can't submit time cards? What about the contractors who are being furloughed and can't submit their, their hours? There's so many other people that, that are getting unpaid leave. That means that they're going to go into save mode. They're not going to be buying things. That's going to have implications for the retail market. This is going to tumble through all of the U.S. economy. We're less than a week right now. Um, barely. We're one day shy of a week. But if it goes two weeks, that starts to hit a pay period for most people. And that's the point where, where I, I know most of my life it was one pay period went to rent, the other pay period went to, to bills with a little bit left over at the end of the month. Yeah, yeah. two weeks I'd be looking for a new job. Yeah, but where are the new jobs? Well, that being <laughs> a crappy job. I mean, that's the problem, right? So, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, okay. Well, anyway, we should do a show. Um, anyway, <laughs> yes. uh, you know, we have no politics here. We're uh, I'm uh, as a Canadian, your your American politics mystify and confuse me. So, yeah. um, now for anyone who's never done this before, uh, we're going to do a live episode of Astronomy Cast, and we're going to. This is the thing that ends up in the podcast. So we'll take about uh, you know half an hour, 20, 27 minutes or so. I try to aim for to record this episode, uh, and then we'll stick around for a few minutes afterwards and maybe answer some of your questions about space and astronomy, either what we talked about in the show or what we talked about. Uh, whatever you want, whatever. Stump Pamela, be my guest. I dare Just you. Just don't make me cry. I, I dare you to make her cry. Um, no, 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 no. That that requires discussing more of the shutdown. You can make me cry with oh, hard problems, oh, just not with the hard shutdown. problems. Okay. Well, I I I defy you to make Pamela cry from hard problems. Um, uh, yeah, and so you can you can post your questions two places, and really there's one place now. So we used to use this gadget that allowed us to see all the comments flowing into this one location, and it has gotten sort of worse and worse over time. Uh, so the place that you we really recommend now is over on YouTube, which, as we always note, if you come and make your comments on YouTube, you will raise the quality of the comments on YouTube by a significant amount, and we really appreciate that. So, so wherever you're watching this video now, if you feel the need to chime in, click, it should be down on the bottom right, click to watch on YouTube, and then you should see there's comments there, and I'm commenting there right now. So, so while we're doing the show, I'll talk to you, it'll be fun. So that's the best place. If you need to, if you're also watching this over on the event page, you can make some comments there. I can't promise I'll see it. Uh, anywhere else, I'm just not, I'm just not going to see it, and I apologize because there's just now there's 40 different places to try and watch these comments. So <clears throat> YouTube's the best place. If it looks like I'm not responding to your questions, it's because you're not posting it on YouTube. Um, God, I can't believe I'm driving people to YouTube. Uh, this is where we are. Okay. Um, Google cool. won. Google, Google wins. Um, they'll win. I, for one, I mentioned this last night, I, for one, welcome my Google, Google robot, overlords. Google I, overlords. I, yeah. I'm right there with you. I yeah. have to admit that. Yeah. I think we, we appreciate you treating us as good pets. Um, okay. Cool. Okay. So are you ready to record? I, I believe so. Okay. Are you in mono? Uh, no. That's... Thank you. It's the little things I watch. Okay. I am ready to press record. Uh, okay, I'm also ready to press record. Oh, let me check out my intro ready. Okay, I'm good. Okay, here we go. Testing, I am testing. pressing record. I have also pressed record. I love seem a little low. I think I'm doing it's the okay. wrong. Yeah, it's the wrong mic. Ha. <sighs> okay, hold on. Foiled. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping. I'm glad I caught that. That would have sucked. Testing, testing. Yeah, way better. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it was the the. I don't know why the audio was set to capture my mic on the uh, the camera, which is good, but not good enough. <clears throat> Failed okay. happens. All right. Okay. Whatever you're ready. I'm pressing record again, and it's recording. I have also pressed record, and it is also recording. So here we go.
Okay. Astronomy Cast, episode 316, Observational versus Experimental Science. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Doing well. Now, we're not doing well. We, uh, yeah, we mentioned we're lying. This. We're lying. <laughs> we the are... government shutdown hurts. Yes, it certainly it hurts. does. Yeah. For me, all of the pictures, all the resources, all of the press releases, all of the uh, reporters, everyone that we try to sort of make access with, they're all offline. No missions, no scientists, nothing. It is just emptiness. So there's lots of other stories going on, but but we're really sort of having to route around with, with Universe today. But that's nothing for what compared to what you've got happening. Yeah, I, I have to admit to being uh, just shy of full-on freak-out mode about uh, what's going to happen with National Science Foundation deadlines and uh, the backlog of paperwork that's going to be generated by being down for so long and how we're going to get our money moving into the future and, and I'm going to stop now. Okay, but but you know, and just to just to see if I can push you to cry, uh, and uh, the National Radio Astronomical Observatory was shut down, NOAA yes. was shut down. Like it's just, it is. You know, there is no science happening from the U.S. government at all. So, yeah. So there you go. That's where we are right now. Hopefully next week we'll be like, woohoo, it's over, and now we can get back to our work. And I don't think that's going to happen. So. If, if you want to help and you're in the United States, write your Congress critters, senators, representatives. Uh, if you're not in the United States and you have some money to give, donate to your, fi your favorite science program um, because right now that's the only source of funding a lot of us have. Uh, the Sarcastic Rover has got a great suggestion, which you should check out at some point. They're recommending that people do their own science, so they do some science, yes. take a picture of it, and tweet it at the at the Sarcastic Rover, and and that'll that'll help. Do science on CosmoQuest. There you go. All Our right. site is still up. All right. Well, let's get on with the episode. So sometimes you do science by watching patiently, and sometimes you've just got to get your hands dirty with an experiment or two. These two methods have their advantages and disadvantages for revealing nature's secrets. Let's talk about how and why scientists choose which path to go down. Uh, now, you threw this topic at me, so uh, I'm going to let you uh, explain your underlying rationale, but and you actually gave it a little bit more of a controversial topic, which is <laughs> which is battle of the scientists, right? Yes, yes. It's well, not a it... battle, isn't it a toolkit? <laughs> isn't it, a, isn't it a, like a series of tools that, that good scientists use depending on the nature of the question they're trying to solve? Well, so, so one of the weird things that you encounter is what's considered a large data set varies from science to science. In, in some fields, uh, you get thousands of data points. In astronomy, you're sometimes kind of happy to have one. And, and there's fields in between. Uh, anthropologists, um, how often do you get lucky enough to dig up a pristine find? Uh, animal scientists, how often do you get lucky enough to witness this or that usage of tools? And at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's often a, a discussion of, well, you don't have statistically significant enough research, is, is the argument you hear from the experimentalists, whereas as the observationalists, like, yes, six data points. And um, it, it was just one of those things that it's interesting to see how um, we're trying to figure out how to be as statistically significant with observational scientists as the experimentalists get to be. Okay, so let's get into a clarification of terms here. So when you're okay. talking about observational science, what is what does that mean? Observational scientist is when you are the type of researcher that just sort of hopes that you're going to uh, generally purposefully stumble across the type of object or scenario that you wish to study. So as, as someone who studies variable stars, I will watch them closely looking for things like phase shifts or the Blazko effect, which is a change in amplitude of some sorts of RLRE stars. Um, as, as someone who uh, 
has has collaborated with people who work on uh, colliding galaxy clusters. You go out, you look at a whole bunch of what you believe are galaxy clusters, and you hope some of them are in the process of colliding. Um, anthropologists dig. It's it's a matter of you make your own fate by going out and turning over rocks until what you want to study is found under the rock you flip over. Um, economists deal with this a bit too because yes. in many cases there are ex there are experiments, natural experiments that are s kind of morally dubious to perform, right? <laughs> like splitting up two children and having one raised in one family and another raised in another family. That that's not a good thing to do. But what they look for, I guess, is these situations where this has happened, whether yeah. you know two, two twins are put up for adoption and then you can go and seek these situations and then you can observe the results and not feel like you're a bad person. Yeah, I don't think that's necessarily the economist, but yeah, economy, economists have lots of other dubious scenarios to deal with. Let's not try tanking the U.S. economy to see how quickly it recovers. Right, um, exactly. But if it but look, accidentally but look, happens. Right, but look for, a, look for an economy that did tank and try and figure right. out why it, why it happened. So, yes. you know. But no, but like, you know, even like earning power or education levels or right. things like that. So there's all these situations where you're looking for something that you're observing. Okay, so that's, that's an observational scientist. Yes. What is an experimental scientist? An experimental scientist is someone who, who gets to deal with controls. Someone who will very carefully set, set up scenarios where you're tweaking one or a specific set of variables in known ways to see what happens. Um, in, in some cases, uh, you are, with the Large Hadron Collider, repeatedly causing experiments of varying energies to see to happen to see what particles are formed in some cases you are working in the laboratory and exciting gases to different temperatures to see what spectral lines are emitted but you always have this nice controlled environment sometimes less controlled than you'd like but you understand where things are going wrong or you can at least retroactively figure out where things were going wrong and prove it by doing another experiment and you get to vary the parameters to, to understand the entirety of the picture and uh, it's nice Right, but you, but of course the limit is what you can control because it'd be sure, sure nice to smash galaxy clusters together and and, and sort of see yes. what what happens, but obviously you can't you can't do that. And and it's very difficult to explore in a laboratory all the possible ways that a star of a given mass and metallicity uh, can can evolve, or I guess a series of masses or a series of metallicities can evolve. We just can't do that. So we're stuck trying to look through the universe to find, um, well, artificial laboratories that allow us to, um, through more natural means, find clusters of data points that step through the different parameter space. So now, do scientists end up going down one road or the other? I mean, I said, you called it battle. So is it a battle? Um, do they I, hate each other? I, I think it, not as much as people who do experiments and observation tend to mock. And it's not hate. It's it's the, the mocking that you get, for instance, between college football teams. Um, I, I think we all universally gang up on the theorists because it's fun. And <laughs> Everybody hates the theorists. <laughs> Everybody gives the theorists a hard time. We all doing, give the theorists a right, hard time. Right, because they're not observing or experimenting. They're just thinking. Yes. Send all um, email to uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> a at no. uh. But uh, so so when it comes to the experimentalists versus the observationalists, it's not so much a battle or a hate, but you do occasionally get the odd comments on a refereed paper where uh, your referee was not the same thing you are. So. You also run into just general frustrations and gaps in knowledge if you're one and you run into frustrations and gaps in knowledge due to lack of funding to do experiments in the other. Um, so a lot of observational science is figuring out how to get around your lap, lack of laboratory. Right. I guess with observational science, you can do, really do it on the cheap because someone was so kind to smash galaxy clusters together for you. Exactly. You exactly. just need to observe them. 
and and experimentalists, well, they have a lot more funding struggles because, well, at the end of the day, um, whatever it is that you're doing in your lab takes money to run, probably. So then, like, what kinds of answers, what kinds of questions are the two different methodologies really appropriate for? So, for instance, let's go back to that stellar evolution problem. How do stars of different masses, different metallicities evolve? This is where we're really lucky to have globular clusters to look at. The stars in an individual globular cluster were all formed at about the exact same time and out of pretty much the same set of materials. So all of the stars in a given cluster have the same birthday, uh, or at least birth millennium. And they all have the same makeup of materials, the same amount of iron, the same amount of titanium and scandium. And so when we look at an individual globular cluster, the one variable that we have to deal with is the mass of the star. So we can see at a given age, what do all of the red dwarfs look like? What do all of the O-type stars look like? And if we look at a variety of different globular clusters, we can see a variety of different ages. We can also see a variety of different metallicities. So by looking at all the globular clusters we can, we can start to explore the parameter space of how do stars evolve if they're metal rich, if they're metal poor. In metal rich you need to add in open clusters, a younger type of star formation uh, or star group rather. Um, what do they look like when they're young? You get that from open clusters. What do they look like when they're old? You get that from globular clusters. So stellar clusters, open or globular, allow us to explore the parameter space of stellar evolution. Uh, with galaxy evolution, um, by looking at different mass and different age galaxy clusters, we can see what happens in dense environments where there's a high probability of collision, of um, gravitational interaction, things like ram pr pressure stripping. Um, and we can start to understand what are the triggers for star formation. Uh, what happens when things collide? All of these different things we're still trying to understand because galaxy clusters are a lot harder to observe. But we at least have the clusters to look at to start to put these different pieces together. I think one of my favorites is things like the like type 1a supernovae, right? Yes. Where you've got just this this tremendous event that happens really rarely. It's a, such an exotic thing, right? But yet, yeah. But yet they're happening out there, pop, 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 out in space, and so you can observe them and get tons of science out of it. The I mean, the the universe is a pretty big place, and um, so when you start to look at things that are one supernova in general per 100 years per spiral galaxy, you just look at 100 galaxies and it starts to become easier and easier. Now as you start looking at specific types of galaxies, uh, specific types of supernovae, it gets harder and harder, but there's still so many thousands of easily observed galaxies and millions and billions of galaxies in general that it's possible to explore this parameter space. Uh, another great example is the current search for planets with the Kepler, well unfortunately Kepler's not doing it anymore, but the Kepler Space yeah. Telescope where where it's just looking for those situ those situations where this planet is just passing in front of the yeah. of the star and so you can make the observation. It's only a fraction of stars that you can actually do that, but for the ones you can, that tells you a ton of information. Right, and here's another one of those of, of the probability is so rare because you figure not all planet, not all stars have planets. A lot of them, but not all stars have planets. And of those that do have planets, in order to observe the transient, you have to have a very precise alignment so that the orbit cuts exactly across the minuscule disk of the star. Um, so, so given it could be face on, edge on, and all the angles in between. The fact that this works because there are so many stars to observe is really kind of amazing. Yeah. Okay, so I think we've, we've understood, and I think you can apply that to n the non-astronomy fields, although why would you bother? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the observational stuff, right? Right. Look at enough colonies of chimpanzees or gorillas and you're going to see the different types of communication, upbringing, and tool usage that, that are endemic in, in their different cultures. But I, you know, but I'm going to make the sort of the bold claim that there are very few sciences 
that are so reliant on observation as astronomy that yeah. you know even with the chimpanzees and the gorillas you could get in there and muck with their little lifestyle yes and and start performing some experiments but you unless you have a way to crash galaxy clusters together you know with astronomy yeah you can smash impactors into the moon and you'll dig up some some material now you've performed an experiment but the rest of it is all observation Exactly, exactly. And this is where astronomy is one of the fields that, that we're most able to get excited over seeing one example of something, seeing six examples of something. Most other fields call that a fluke. Uh, animal science is, is one of the few examples of another field where when the question is natural behaviors, things occurring in the wild, um, you're again going back to and human studies is another form of animal science, uh, you're going back to being a purely observational field. Yeah, how many planets have life on them? <laughs> right, one. One, yeah. it's a very small set. Okay, so let's talk about experimentation then. So, so what does an experimental scientist do? Well, here you take one thing that you want to study or one class of things that you want to study and you find some parameter that you're interested in understanding and you step through all the different ways to explore that parameter. The example that, that I turn to the most often is uh, spectroscopy, trying to empirically get at what are all of the different energy levels that can be observed within atoms and molecules. And there was a vast amount of work done down at Los Alamos lab where people working in the lab and also doing quantum mechanic uh, calculations to verify and then project out where, where lines were predicted, they figured out what are all the possible energies of different atoms, of different isotopes of different atoms, and all of this can be used by us astronomers as we're trying to figure out the compositions of stars. Now, the the disturbing side of this is a, I, I got to use a lot of these resources coming out of Los Alamos when I was a grad student doing stellar spectroscopy, and I was kind of amused and not thinking. Um, I, I found it interesting that we understood carbon so well, that we understood oxygen so well, and then I had it pointed out to me that these are things that life is made of, that organics is made of. And Isn't that also things that can be lit on fire? Well, it's, more than that, I mean, at, at a certain point, uh, the, the types of things they're studying aren't the results of basic burning. No, they, they were actually trying to figure out what energies uh, disassociate the electrons from atoms in uh, organic molecules, and we are one giant organic. Right, and so they like wonder what happens if we throw a sandwich in the in the machine. What happens if we, you know? <laughs> well, was... or or more to the point of what would happen to the human bodies atoms and molecules if it was exposed to this super high energy that happens to be the side effect of a hydrogen bomb. And that starts to get depressing. But it's an experimental science to figure this out by taking atoms that aren't involved in being a human being and exciting them to ever higher and higher energies and seeing what happens. Right. Uh, but, but you can imagine things like, like what does the spectroscopic signature of iron look like? Or right. what does the signature of uranium look like? And these are the things right. they find in stars. So, you know, they had to, like, what do they do to, f to figure out what what <laughs> iron looks like? Do they burn it? How do they? It, it's it's, it's uh, not so much burning as uh, creating a, a gas that, that has this suspended in the gas and uh, waiting to see how you can excite it. Um, it. Not all atoms are gotten at experimentally, but a lot of them you can build various types of gases. Uh, rubidium gas is one of my favorite ones because as light passes through it, it slows down to like walking speed. And anytime you can slow light passing through a medium to uh, the rate at which I can get from one side of the lab to the other, and in fact, I can beat the light across yeah. the lab. Come That's kind of awesome. Hurry up, light. Yeah. Come on, let's go, <laughs> slowpoke. So exactly. I think one really great example where the lines are starting to blur is, and we talked about this last week, the Large Hadron Collider. Suddenly, yes. you've got an experimentation device that allows you to do things that previously would only be possible with observation. 
Well, and more than that, they some of the energies that they're hitting with the Large Hadron Collider, um, there was only one experiment, and we call it the Big Bang, and we can't go back and watch it. But some of the other experiments that are really awesome are the neutron bombardment experiments, where they're replicating the conditions inside a supernovae and working to build ever heavier atoms and push the periodic table to higher and higher numbers or uh, create new radioactive isotopes that ever so quickly cascade down into other more stable things, but we get to see all of the different isotopes along the way and measure how long they're able to last. So what are some other fields that, or other what are currently observational type situations, could you see being brought into the experimentation world, or, or maybe vice versa? Well, I mean, right now when it comes to asteroid science, a lot of what we do is we take spectra of asteroids, we kind of formulate based on the, the reflected light, what the composition of the asteroid is. Uh, we are trying to, to guess with the surface of Mars, and it's not guess, it, it's very careful analysis and scientific reasoning. Uh, we're working to figure out which craters are the mouths of volcanoes versus craters formed via impacts. This is observation, not going out and measuring and sampling it would be awesome to be able to figure out what is the chemical diversity of asteroids by going out and bringing back samples from a myriad of different asteroids. It would be amazing to go out and be able to determine if all of these small rocks we think came from Vesta actually did by well, grabbing a sample of Vesta and all of the small rocks and looking to see if they are truly chemically the same. So all of these different things where we're saying we think the following based on these observations. If we had ground truth sampling, if we could go out and pick up a rock and bring it back, well then we could say for certainty. And another one of these is the ages of different surfaces. We've brought back mar we've brought back moon rocks and we've begun to to tie together, well this area of the moon is this age and has this many craters and use that to expand out to make assumptions about what are the ages of of surfaces on Mars, on Mercury and other rocky bodies. But there's been a, a lot of estimations and theorization going into figuring out, well, do Moon and Mars areas that have the same cratering necessarily have the same age? Some people say yes, some people give really good reasons for why no. If we could just go pick out a rock, we'd know for certain which is or, which. Or smash asteroids into them, right? Wouldn't that help us? That would kind of create a polluted sample. Well, you know, part of the moon, just smash part of the moon with a bunch of asteroids, just keep smashing them in and, like, looking at the size of the craters that happen and, you know, keep running your experiment. And then and what if we hit it with, like, a Mars, like, ram Mars into the Earth? That would help find out if we could make the moon. That would definitely um, kill this, this planet-harming society we've created, I guess. Um, All right. All right. <laughs> I'll shelve that experiment. <laughs> so I guess for, you know, if, let's say that someone's listening to the show and they, they love science and they really want to get into uh, a, a, a field in science. How can you sort of self-diagnose your preference for the observational side, the experimental side, and know which paths to go down? I, I think at a certain level there's a very definite personality difference. Uh, if you're an observational person, there's a whole lot of hurry up and wait. And, and so you have to develop that, okay, I'm going to take the time to find a thousand objects. Hope 500 of them are maybe doing what I want. Study those and then draw conclusions and know that there's going to be gaps in my understanding because I couldn't fully explore the parameter space. That requires patience. Uh, at the same time, if you're more of an immediate satisfaction kind of person, um, there's that laboratory experience of let me go into my lab and build this thin film and see how it interacts with this color of light and chew through a bunch of different types of thin films. So it really depends on whether or not you feel like you want to be on nature's schedule or, <laughs> right. or whether nature is going to be on your schedule. Right, and, and I, I have to also point out that um, 
if you want to be the one doing the observations rather than using archival data or survey data, um, you also probably have to be uh, happy not just being on nature schedule but being in nature. One of my more interesting ex experiences as an observational astronomer was looking down and seeing a very small frog climbing out of my exobite drive and understanding that might be why my last exobite tape didn't work so well. Um, so going outside and being one with nature is is also sometimes part of it. Although there's now remote, remote telescopes and that makes it a little bit different. Well, I think the, the classic example is uh, we did uh, the Venus, we did a show on Venus and talking about the Venus transits and just the, the horrible uh, oh. distances that people had to go and the ordeals they went through just to make this two hour, you know, six hour observation. Yes. And, and if they missed it, then they missed it. And that's it. Well, you don't get another chance. And, and we still have things like that going on. There, there's people who are trying to look for moons of, of Pluto by watching for, for occultations where an asteroid is, is observed to pass in front of it. Or they're trying to uh, measure various shapes of things by watching for Pluto to go in front of a star and measuring the timing of fading of the background star. Um, that that's the route that most normally happens is Pluto passing in front of a star. Um, but where you go on the planet uh, dictates what you're going to see and so you have to go to that place where the, the occultation is most perfect and it's not necessarily a wide band of planet. So if you could have one observation mm. If you know some, you know, like we could send a spacecraft anywhere, we could build a whatever, a huge telescope, we could launch into space. It could be a light years diameter. What, what would, you, what observation do you wish you could make? I, I don't know if any of those things would specifically help me with the one I'm most interested in, but, but the thing we haven't managed to see yet is a black hole merger either two stellar black holes actively going zoink and merging and releasing vast amounts of energy and gravitational waves, or, or even better, the, the merger of uh, supermassive black holes inside of colliding galaxies that are in the process of merging. And uh, I think that would be kind of awesome to find a system in the process of merger. And what would it take to, to like, would it be like a big gravitational wave detector, a a huge telescope? Well, it probably you'd want to have all of those things going on. I mean, imagine the scenario where uh, you're able to finally get LISA orbiting the, the uh, interferometric gravitational wave detector that's been proposed to put into orbit and hopefully will have much greater sensitivity than the one on Earth that hasn't successfully detected anything yet. Imagine if you're able to detect something with LISA or some similar program that gets launched and somehow get lucky enough to image the field and capture the light in, in maybe even multiple wavelengths. Uh, gamma ray burst detector nails it, gets the x-ray, gets the optical all at once. Um, getting that multi-wavelength data with the gravitational waves and then multiple colors of light, that would be pretty awesome. Now what about an experiment? What's an experiment that you would wish you could run? Oh man! Um, and like literally, you can crash galaxy clusters together if you, <laughs> if you need to. Like anything in variable stars? Is there anything in variable stars oh. where you had to like make these tough observations that would have been so nice if you could just? If if I could like manually control the magnetic field on a star while it's pulsating and see what happens, that would make me very happy. Just have a knob connected to the. the stellar dynamo and crank that magnetic field up and down and watch how it affects the various pulsation modes. Awesome. Well, hopefully when the, uh, <laughs> when the, when the shutdown ends, you can put in a grant for that. And we'll get exactly. That, uh, we'll get that mission going. All right. Well, thank you very much, Pamela. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I lost my mouse. There it is. Don't go anywhere. We're just going to export our audio and then we will take your questions. Okay. We always look squirrely at this stage because we have screens all around us. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry we're not paying attention. <clears throat> there are only so many things we can do at the same time. And this tests the very limit.
Okay, I'm safe. Um, Greg Layden, Laden, Laden, Laden says um, it's all about building. Uh, what did he say? It was really great. Ultimately, isn't all about making a working ray gun? Exactly. <laughs> Right? So you just have a working ray gun. Freeze ray gun. Freeze, the freeze, freeze sure. ray gun. Yeah, and you just zap different elements, and, they, <laughs> and then you can measure the spectroscopy of them. Zot. Um, all right. Uh, actually, Greg had a whole bunch of really interesting things to say on, uh, on YouTube. Um, Thomas Stranaker says, thanks to Pamela, I am now in university and next week doing my grad oh, work awesome. in a nuclear plant. Thanks, Pamela. That's really cool. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, Thomas uh, worked with us helping us out at CosmoQuest for a little while and uh, we're really proud to see what all he's accomplished. That's terrific. Um, let me see if i got anything else. I don't think I have any questions. If you have any questions, now's your chance. Post your questions either on the... Uh, <laughs> Post your questions either on uh, YouTube YouTuber, or, YouTube? or the event page, yeah. Okay. Yeah, either one. I'm watching both. Um, Hugo Burnham wants to know, would seeing a black hole merger make Pamela cry with joy? Uh, I, I'm not so much the cry with joy person, but giggle <laughs> stupidly like a mad scientist, maybe. I'm a giggler. <laughs> I can contest. I can test that. Um... That's it. Let me see if I got any more questions here. Nobody's got questions for us. It's weird. There's a lot of comments, but they're mostly talking about the shutdown. Oh. Yeah. Um. We were so giggly until you said that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll let it run for a couple more seconds, and then if, if nobody has a question for you. God, I mean, i got to think of a really, really hard question then. Hmm. No, I got nothing. Um, uh, well, Fleming wants to know, anyone got a link for Friday's Space Hangout? We actually had to cancel the Space Hangout on Friday because everybody couldn't show up. We were like, in shutdown. Yeah, so it was... She double hockey stick. Yeah, so it was it was just sort of a gong show, and everybody yeah. it was like a perfect storm. Hey, have you seen Gravity yet? No, I haven't. Neither. I'm gonna go see it tomorrow. I I've heard that you have to watch it in IMAX. I it's not possible. I'll be able to watch oh. it in 3D though. This is what happens. You live on an island. I know. Uh, yeah, we're lucky if um, if some movies make it through our through our town. Uh, but uh, and Phil watched it, and he. Yeah. Uh, and he, I, unfortunately, I kind of got spoiled to some of the problems with the science, and and so now I'm going to be, those are going to stick out like sore thumbs. Why can't, like, this is like the best, I haven't seen the movie yet, but this is like the best possible implementation of a space science movie, and, you know, according to Phil, there's a bunch of kind of glaring problems. Mm. Yeah, so, anyway. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. Just a misunderstanding of they say, clearly orbits. need to be they clearly need to be hiring Phil to be their science advisor. Well, that Kevin Grazier worked on it. Oh. Yeah, I know, but I, from what I understand, I think he they just he just sort of at some point said this is it. This is the yeah. This is the science. If you guys want to do a story, that's up to you. Yeah. So. You have to do that at a certain level. Yeah. Uh, Th Thomas wants to know: Is a personal spectroscope spectroscope Spectroscope? Worth spectroscope. Nine. Spectroscope. Um, if you have a dome, a large telescope, and a whole lot of patience, and enough clear skies that when something happens, like a nearby supernovae, you know you're going, supernova, you know you're going to be able to go out and capture it. Um, if you live in a cold, blustery, snowy, often bad weather environment, which I'm pretty sure you do, it's probably not a good thing. Just It just rains. So all telescopes are worthless. It just rains. Um, uh, Orgy wants to know, when will common ice become visible in binoculars, and will it be a morning object? So it's magnitude 10 right now. If so, your binoculars are big enough. Yep. Yeah. You can see it right now. Yeah. In fact, actually, in the uh, virtual star party last night, uh, 
dad showed off a picture that he had taken from his horrible light polluted Los Angeles skies and it was beautiful just a beautiful yeah picture. and and Peter Lake's been posting stuff up on Google Plus from eye telescope yeah yeah so yeah that, that he released that picture just like three hours ago four hours ago it's, it's so cool. cool yeah um, uh, Christine Grosvenor says, anyone who's placed Kerbal Space Program knows they got it wrong. That is exactly correct. Yes, yes. And if you have not played, if you have any interest in orbital mechanics and launching go rockets, go play this game. Uh, my son and I are absolutely hooked on it. We have, uh, we have landed on the moon, we have launched from the moon, uh, and returned. So we've, we're, and now I really understand sort of how to play the game, but I also totally understand like orbital mechanics now in a way that I didn't before just all this kind of thing right about yeah. you know when you how you thrust and how you change your different orbits to get to different objects and and how the burns work and all of that it's just it's yeah. completely changed my understanding of the way spaceflight works so if you have any interest in this all I highly recommend you play Kerbal Space Program uh, so totally agreed um, Graham, uh, Graham Stickings says, uh, is quantum mechanics a place where you are both using observational and experimental due to the uncertainty principle? Um, that somehow feels like it breaks Copenhagen. Uh, quantum mechanics is really an experimental science, but you're building up your your results by looking at a population result so run multiple populations through versus looking at individual results so that's a confused answer basically you can't have one data point for any given parameter you have to have uh, an entire statistical consortium of, of data points for that particular variable value and then you change the variable and look at a new population um, so it's population statistics instead of individual objects that are being played with. Uh, one more minute. Oh, okay. Uh, Guido Bibra is saying that Samantha Cristoforetti did a great post about gravity today and found even more problems than Phil. So, yeah. <sighs> so yeah. sad. Yeah. So sad. But the point being to try and get from, from one object in space in orbit to another object in orbit not possible unless you have very large rockets. So if you're at the Hubble Space Telescope and you want to get over to the International Space Station and you want to get over oh, to... Oh, that one's a pain in the head. Right. Yeah. Right. That's all. So, that, so that's all. So as you're watching the show, just think, hmm, can't move from object to object. So that's all. Um, uh, cool. Okay, well, I think uh, I think we're good. Okay. I think that's, that's all the questions that I see. I can't see any more. Uh... Lance asks, have we done a show on the difference between failed stars and hot Jupiters? We've done a um, show on hot Jupiters, and we've done a show on failed stars. We've done a show on various dwarf stars, right? So, so yeah, I, I think the way we looked at it is what's the division between a, a big Jupiter and a baby star? So brown dwarfs, essentially. Um, the transition... What what's required for something to be considered a star? Well, it probably had to burn something at some point. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, oh right, and Christina's waiting for some Kerbal videos for me. So yeah, my son and I are going to be doing. We're actually just figuring out how to set this up, and and we're going to teach you how to fly in orbit and how to land on the moon and cool and so on. So we'll we'll do that shortly. Uh, cool. Okay. Well, I think we're good. We've we've run through all of the questions that I see right now. Uh, thanks everyone for watching. Pamela, thanks as always for providing your brain to us, and uh, and we'll see everyone uh, next week. Sounds great.